There we go. Okay. All right, welcome to lecture three about parameter fitting with Dr. Hellerstein. Well, greetings. So um, I caught the tail end of the last lecture. And so at this point, you should have a good understanding of um, what's involved with building kinetic models and some feeling for you know, the kinds of things that can go wrong in, in your model construction. Something like um, a species ends up having a um, you know an unlimited value for its concentration. So this lecture picks up on another aspect of the basics of building a model. And that is when you look at the models, we have a bunch of parameters that are present. And the question is, where do those come from? How do we estimate them? And that's say uh, the topic here, parameter fitting. Sometimes you'll also hear the word um, uh, parameter calibration. Uh, that's uh, another name for essentially the, the same activity. So to provide a little bit of context and, um, Oh, Lucien, I'm not really monitoring the chats. Um, yeah, I can monitor the chat if you like. Okay, yeah, thanks. Yeah, please let me know. Yeah. Thanks. I, uh, also, if people feel like just breaking in and saying something, they should. That's also okay. But, but yeah, I can. I can. I, I will, I I'll interrupt that. you with a chat and have official okay. interruptions. Yeah. Yeah, that's great because I think um, what I try to do, um, I should also add, this lecture is really in two parts. The, the first part really provides sort of the, the, the motivation context, a little bit of theory, and the second part gets into actual calculations. So um, I certainly want to make sure that the, the conceptual part, the first part, makes sense because obviously the calculations won't make any sense if the conceptual part doesn't. All right, so... So this is a model, and I don't, um, Lucien, have you already introduced the, the Wolf glycolytic oscillation model? Has we, have, no, we have not. We have not. We actually, we haven't really talked about SPML at all. So. Okay. All right. So um, uh, this is a model that um, we, we've sort of beaten to death in our work because it's, uh, it has some very nice properties. Um, it shows some interesting behavior in a relatively uh, simple representation of glycolysis, and uh, the model itself is is sort of manageable. There, I think there are um, eleven reactions, uh, and so that that makes it very nice. It's a nice paper as well. If you read the paper, it it actually goes well beyond the the parts that that we sort of focus on here. And what I have down below here is um, you know, parts of the abstract about what this is about. Um, this is partly intracellular, but also intercellular dynamics. And that showing that in certain parameter regimes, you actually can end up with um, oscillatory behavior. And the part that I want to highlight here is this part down here, depending on the kinetic parameters. So these were the values of the constants that you saw in your last example, like in the Michaelis Menten, uh, the V sub M, and there was a K sub M. Um, those are examples of kinetic parameters. Uh, in mass action, typically we just have one uh, kinetic parameter. The question is, where do these things come from? Um, there are typically measurements of these parameters, or many of them, they will have measurements, but it, it's not going to be under physiological conditions or very rarely. Um, and so we have a sense of you know, rough ranges or maybe orders of magnitude, but the actual values we don't know. And I want to underscore, you know, depending on the kinetic parameters. So you got to choose the right values of these parameters to get the behavior uh, that you'll see in this model. And of course, we're interested in behavior that's representative of some observational data. So you know, how do we come about getting these parameters? So let me go through this a, a little bit more detail. And then, you know, that's the part about agreeing with experimental data. So here's the, the wolf gokulilic model. Um, you've seen, I think, all of these constructs already. Uh, something maybe you're less familiar with is this um, uh, the, the use of the equal sign here. Um, this is actually just sort of... of um, uh, and this is indicates it's a um, unidirectional reaction. I mean, actually, the kinetics ultimately determine whether or not it is, but you know, don't get hung up on this being an equal sign versus just a dash. 
Uh, the names are much longer than what you've seen before, but other than that, I think the constructs are similar. They've tried to be a little bit more meaningful. So there's an external supply of glucose. And you know what the dollar sign means? That uh, you know this is a uh, a fixed species. Somehow it's being controlled, like with a chemostat, or uh, that would control the amount of glucose that's being flushed into the system. Um, and so that's the rate at which we'll see glucose appear. And there's a, a fixed rate kinetics here. So there's nothing that's being multiplied there. This is just a constant. Um, and then we see, um, you know, this, you know, first step, early step in glycolysis where glucose and ATP and we're converting to uh, fructose one six bisphosphate and so on. And then, the, you know, some of the, some of the kinetic uh, some of the, the rate laws over here are a little bit longer than what you've experienced. Part of the length is actually because they're spelling out names of variables. So, um, and we have reaction, J0 is this boundary reaction. We go to J10, so a total of 11 reactions. And what I wanted to point out over here is um, these are the constants. So if you go through each one of these uh, reactions and you look at their rate laws, you know, what follows the semicolons and you pick up the things that are constant. So these are not, you know, for example, J zero underscore input flux is a constant. Um, in this rate law over here, we have this constant J one underscore K one, but glucose is not a constant. That is a, um, a chemical species uh, that's gonna vary over time, similarly with ATP. So, uh, so I'm just picking up the things that are constants and we end up with, I think it's about a total of about 16 of them. So we have uh, 11 reactions and 16 constants. Um, they're set to particular values. Obviously you can't even run the simulation unless you have a value for the constants because uh, you know, I guess um, by default, I think. Tellurium, does Tellurium give you a warning now if you don't have a value assigned to a constant? I don't recall. Tellurium actually refuses to run without variables assigned to constants. It will let you run without variables assigned to species, um, and it will assume that those values are zero. Okay, but it will not run. But if you don't it, assign it, it, a variable... A constant right, to right. a value. We'll say like, a hey, you never defined J6. You never defined it. It won't assume that it's zero. Okay, right. good. Because I mean, it really is an error. Um, you right. know, yeah, you know what to do. That was okay. that was put in on the very first simulator I ever wrote back in the mid '80s because I realized that was that was that was causing problems for me. If you forgot yeah, to absolutely. assign it, right? Yeah, right. I, yeah, absolutely. And it's so. I mean, as you can tell, I mean, even from the simple networks you did in the, you know, the last, um, the last lecture, even simple networks, it's really easy to introduce errors, um, just typographical errors that are hard to catch. And I mean, even things that you think should, you know, the, the last example is a great one, you know, just trying to figure out something with two reactions, why does this behave the way it does? And then on top of this, the potential for typographical errors, so becomes complicated. And so here's the behavior that this system produces. We see some initial transients as you know we get away from our uh, the initial conditions of this network. I don't show the initial values for the various chemical species. Um, since this is a very nonlinear system, the initial values pro I don't think make a huge difference. Um, for, for if this was you know a different kind of system, initial values might make more difference. Um, but eventually we get into get past these transient periods over here. And then you see these very well-defined oscillations. It's about, a, I think it's about five Hertz is what it ends up being. Um, and, you know, for the, you know, we have all the, the different chemical species over here. So um, the other thing to observe here is in this model, look at the range in the values of these constants. Now, obviously the constants have different units depending on you know, what's being multiplied. So the context is a little bit different. Um, but the, if you look at the values of these constants, we got, I guess the smallest one over here is one, but then we go up to something that's you know, like almost 100,000. And so if we're trying to you know, figure out what are our reasonable values or just you know, under what conditions do we get oscillatory behavior, we've got a pretty big search space to try and figure out here. 
uh, because we have big range and lots of constants. So that's sort of the challenge that we're after. And this is an essential part of almost any um, uh, kind of kinetic modeling that you're going to do. Um, after you have the initial model, sort of you feel, feel like you've got it in the right shape, then you're going to get some, you know, some data from some source, either, you know, it's truly empirical data or it's an extrapolation of empirical situation. And then you'll try and figure out these constants. So how do we do it? Let's let's go on to that and think about that a little bit more. Um, so conceptually, what's going on here? We're gonna we're gonna assume a scenario where you're given uh, some observational data. And observations is a bit in air quotes here because sometimes um, we have a synthetic situation we're trying to emulate. So, but but we will treat this. I'll we'll use the term observational data as in this is the the ideal data that we're trying to fit by properly selecting the model by properly constructing the model and then selecting values of parameters. So so how do we do that? How do we go about figuring out all these these uh, parameter values given that this is the kind of model that we want to be able to fit? Okay. So here's the objective. We like to fit the values of parameters so that we make, you know, the model is going to reproduce the observational data. And um, I don't know how many of you folks have had some background in statistics, but sort of one of the core concepts in statistics is it's, it's the, in statistical modeling, there's, there's almost this negative logic that, that you go about thinking that rather than talking about how good my model is relative to observational data, you look at the difference between what the observational data is and what the model produces. That difference is called the residuals. And so you ask a slightly different question. You say, well, how bad are my residuals? How big are my residuals? You know, so it's, it's a little bit of negative logic there. Those, res those residuals, if, if they are really big, then obviously I have a bad model, I, or my model isn't reproducing what I think it should. Um, and so I'm looking to, um, I will do the analysis on the residuals and we'll largely be talking about, um, are the residuals small? And the smaller they are, the, the better our model is. So let's talk a little bit about, you know, sort of a generic algorithm. And, and once we get to the generic algorithm, it's a way of sort of restating a bit more precisely what I've already discussed um, previously um, for um, how, how it is that you're going to find, we're going to find these parameters. So our, our input, so formalize this whole thing, we have a model. And so in our case, it's going to be a reaction network um, that's parameterized, and we're trying to find mod values of those parameters. And um, obviously, the, we can't even run the model until we figure out some values for the parameters. I guess we could set them all to one, but you know what that means is another story. But we need to, you know, every time we, in order to run the model and produce results, we have to have values for the parameters. I mean, as Lucian pointed out, you know, Tolarian won't even let you run unless you assign a value to the to each of the parameters. Then we've got a list of parameters to estimate. And, and the thought here is that there may be some parameters where we actually know the values. Maybe we actually have done some detailed measurements. We're pretty confident we know what those values are. Um, but the other parameters are sort of like it's open season. We've got to figure this out. Now, hopefully, we have at least a range. I mean, because we've got absolutely no idea, then we've got a huge space to search. So hopefully we leave to the sense of, of some of the range. And then the last part is we've got these observational data. I, I call these observed values in, in the following. So those are our inputs and our outputs are going to be uh, values of the, the parameters to estimate. And let's go through the algorithm. So that's the parameters to estimate, that's our output. So here are the steps. And, and this is done in, if you, I don't know how many of you folks have run into the concept of what's called pseudocode. So, I mean, literally parses as false code. And what that means is that um, you use formal programming constructs like a do loop or a for loop or assignment where you can, but there's gonna be a lot of things where we're gonna sort of wave our hands. I'm not sure what goes in here. And for that, we'll use English. Uh, this kind of technique is widely used in the software industry in early stages of building a, a software system where there's some things you know and other things you don't know. And so you just put in English where you don't know. And as you know more, that English gradually gets translated into code. 
And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm using this notion of pseudocode. So do until we get a good estimate. Okay, well, what's a good estimate? So I don't, you know, we'll have to make that more precise later on. Or, or it runs too long. Well, that I can probably define, you know, like if it runs for, you know, a year, that's probably too long. You know, if it runs for a, a minute, well, that's just fine. So we want to, we're, we're going to have some sort of limit on how long we're going to run. So the first step over here is we're going to pick some assignment of values for the parameters. So, you know, like, um, you know, some of these um, uh, kinetic constants, I'm going to pick some value. Now, there's a question about how I pick that value, but I have to have a value just to run the simulation. So once I have, and I call that a setting. Um, so those are the settings of the parameters. Um, so then once I have values assigned the parameters, I can actually run a simulation. So here I run the simulation. I got simulation results. So these are our predictions for this particular assignment of values to the kinetic parameters. And then you remember our friend, the residuals, that's uh, the difference. We've got the observed values, which was, was one of our inputs. There's our observed values. And we subtract from that the simulation results we just produced by this assignment of values to parameters. And then what we look at is now, now here we're trying to make things a little more precise about what it means to have good or bad residuals. Now remember, residuals, since they're a difference between what we observed and what we predicted, they could either be positive or negative because we could either be larger or smaller than the predicted value. So if we say the residuals are too big, you know, we don't, you know, we got to take care of those negative signs. So what we do is we look at the sum of the squares. So everything is positive. And if that sum of the squares is zero, well, obviously everything in there has to be zero. That would be our ideal case. So if the sum of the squares residual is larger than what we had before, then, um, or I'm sorry, is smaller than what we had before, then we probably have a better assignment of parameters. And what we'll do is then we'll say, okay, here, here's our new parameter estimates. It's whatever we set up here, because this, this was smaller. And then down here is if the residuals are very small. So if now we've got to the point where it's not just smaller than the last time, it's actually really close to zero, then we're saying, okay, we're done. Okay, so... So of course, what could happen here is we could, you know, pick a whole bunch of values of assignments, these settings, and go through this loop a lot, never finding anything that's close to, you know, something that's close that produces something close to our observed values, and that's where this exceed time limit comes in. So, any questions on this, on this basic structure? Because if you have this basic structure in hand, um, it, it, the rest of the things will pretty well follow. And if this doesn't make sense then probably the rest won't follow very well. Let me pause for a second, see if there are questions. Uh, I see. Okay, I, I don't know if that's something new. Um, how well would the estimation algorithm perform if I use the sum of squares versus if I use, oh, the mean sum of squares? You know, actually it's gonna be the same. You just have different thresholds for what's small. It doesn't make any difference. I mean, you 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 just have to adjust the constant. If you have the typically, actually, and I'll add on to that. Typically, because the number of observations you have of experimental data is going to change, you probably are going to use the mean sum of squares. I use this as the sum of squares just to avoid the normalization. But um, yeah, and that that's a, that's actually a very reasonable question. Other comment questions? I see a Q and A thing here over here. Oh, okay, that's different. Okay. All right. All right. So if there are no other questions and that actually that was a great question. I appreciate that because that definitely shows that um, you understood what I was saying here, which uh, is a great starting point. OK, so let's move on here. OK, now the challenge here and a lot of what we're going to focus on is this that step one A. How do I pick that new assignment of values? Oh, I see one other something else in chat. Um, Okay, so so this is a question about, do we also consider the standard deviation of sum of squares? That's gonna be a little less important for this because it depends that that standard deviation of sum of squares is in part um, due to some of the dynamics of the system. It, it's a, a next order effect. I'll tell you where that can come in is so far I've assumed that I want the overall fit to be good. 
Maybe I want the fit particularly to be good just after I get past the initials transient. And so what I, I will probably wouldn't think about variance, but what I might do is truncate the early part of the sum of squares and just look at the latter part. So uh, hopefully that's helpful. Um, let's see what else we've got here. Um, yep, yep, okay, user. Okay, so I guess we've got, all right. Um, you're answering your own questions, that's great. Maybe you can give my presentation too, that would be awesome, that'd be even a better step. Okay, let me go back to, to this point right here, the step 1A on the settings. How do we come up with values for, the, for a setting? This is really the crux of the matter. And that is that as we'll see very soon, if you try to do what, what in computer science is called an exhaustive search, where you consider every possible combination of, of uh, values, you quickly find that unless you're dealing with just a couple of parameters and a couple of values of those parameters, it, it's, it's intractable. I mean, you just, the amount of time involved, and I'll go through a little more detail on this later, is, is very, very large. So we need to be somewhat systematic about how we make our choices. Um, yeah, if, um, you know, just, just we have to make sure we choose wisely, as it were. Um, and there are some ways to do this that work under some circumstances. And there are some ad hoc algorithms that and some heuristics that seem to work pretty well, something called differential evolution. It seems to work pretty well in just other circumstances. But that step 1A is really the crux of what makes this um, a demanding task um, computationally. OK, so let's talk about some of the issues here. And actually, um, I'll, 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 there's a concern zero that I should mention as well. I'm going to go back a little bit and uh, yeah, just get back to the model over here. So, um, so one of the things you're worried about if you're doing parameter estimation. So um, one of the questions that probably the first thing you have to be concerned about, which you can sort of detect later on, but um, it's something structurally you have to worry about. And it, a lot of times indicates a, a problem with your model or these limitations on your data. Um, and um, that is, are, parameter, are parameters um, identifiable? What that means is, are my equations structured in such a way and my data that I have available sufficient so that I can actually figure out what this parameter is? So if I have something that, um, you know, for example, if I added another reaction over here uh, with a different species, um, you know, let's see, do I already, I think I already have pyruvate. So, um, you know, May have to figure out, you know, so maybe some, evil, some something else, maybe pentose phosphate. Yeah, you know, so I, I have some other species over here, pentose phosphate, and it has a reaction. Uh, it has no connection with the rest of the model. And when I look at my experimental data over here, I have no measurement of pentose phosphate. So in that case, whatever that reaction is and whatever constants are associated with it, I have absolutely no data to use to calibrate it either directly from observational data or indirectly because of this reaction network. So that parameter, you know, the parameters in, in, that, um, uh, in that reaction would be unidentifiable. There's just no way I can figure it out. I mean, I can get good or bad fits regardless of what the parameter values are. And that's the identifiability problem. You know, what I gave you was an extreme case. This comes about the, the identifiability issue can be more subtle in terms of, you know, the nature of the data or the, uh, the fluxes of these reactions. And so that, that's also a concern. It turns out a lot of times you'll be able to detect an identifiability issue because as you do multiple runs for the parameter fitting, you'll find that certain parameters have a huge variance and it doesn't seem to affect the quality of the fit. And those are likely there where there's an identifiability problem. So I'm not going to go over that explicitly, but conceptually, it's a good thing to know and be aware of. So let me go back to where we were. Here's our algorithm. Okay, now we're on to concern. So that was concern zero, it was identifiability. Let's go to concern one. Okay, this is a classic one for biology. 
you have a large number of parameters and you don't have a very big data set. Um, you know, a, a classic one I know I've run into is in, um, you know, some kind of, of genomics problem where your um, parameters are related to the number of genes, which is in the thousands. And the number of observations you have is probably like 100 or 50, <laughs> something like that. So I mean, it's just ridiculous the the you know the 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 issue that you know I have too many parameters for the size of the data set. So I mean, there's there's a classic here from von Neumann, you know that you know all I need is four parameters and I can do anything. And obviously, you know, in in our models, we're gonna have a lot more than four parameters. Uh, you know, the the um, Wolf model I showed you had had sixteen parameters in it. So and that's relatively modest. Um, Okay, so then there's a second concern, and this is what I'm going to dig into a bit more the computational complexity thing. Um, I think that a lot of people who are outside of, certainly outside of computer science, and, and are maybe a little bit new to modeling, uh, may have the somewhat um, simplistic view that, well, gee, all it takes is more computers. You know, can't we solve the problem that way? Um, in a previous life, I, I worked at Google and was very involved with a lot of the sizing of computers that they had. And we're talking about, you know, on the order of, you know, millions of processing units, many millions of processing units. It just seems huge. I mean, you know, can't we just solve it that way? Well, let's go through and, and, and figure this out. So let's, let's say, we have a very simple situation where let's say each simulation takes a microsecond, which is probably pretty fast for most models, but we'll say that. And, and by a simulation, I mean, this is a single assignment of those parameter settings. So you know, like for the general wolf model, there were 16 parameters. I'd take one value for each one of those parameters. That's a simulation. I'm saying that takes one microsecond. And what I wanna do is then with that assumption, I'm gonna vary the number of parameters and then the number of settings of parameters that I'm considering and I'm going to calculate from that. It's a pretty simple calculation. Then calculate then the log base 10 of the number of hours the simulation takes. So let's take a look at that. So this is a scale. This is the, our log scale. If you take log of a second, you know, log, if you calculate what a second is in an hour, you know, one over, you know, 3,600, take the log of that. That's, you know, obviously it's negative because it's smaller than one. Um, you know, so that's what the value is. Obviously, now we're zero, and here's how our, our scales goes up to the age of the universe. I think I use 14 billion years for the age of the universe. Not sure if that's currently accurate, but, you know, that's our scale. Gives us rough order of that magnitude. So here's what, what we've got over here. Let me explain the, the heat map. So here we're varying the number of parameters. So in General Wolf, we're right over here in that glycolytic observation, 16 parameters. This would be a very small model. I guess the model you're looking at, I think you had three parameters or so in the last session. And then to be honest, you know, any sizable model, you're, you're way well up here. And then there's the number of settings. So this is the number of different values you're considering for each parameter, because each, each combination of values you're considering uh, for each parameter, you've got to do simulations. So, you know, I change one parameter value, I've got to do another simulation to be able to get it out. And you can see what happens over here. I mean, these are taking, you know, if I have, you know, two settings of one parameter, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm well under a uh, very small fraction of a second. As I move to the right over here with the parameters or move to right over here with a number of different settings, you know, I'm starting to get, you know, in this area, we're getting like an hour worth of work over here. So 16 parameters, if I'm just considering four different values, which seems minuscule, you know, if I'm scanning a big space, it seems pretty small. Once I get into things that are sizable, you know, I rapidly go well beyond the age of the universe. I mean, you know, you know so we're, we're talking about the scale over here, 14 is the age of the universe, and I'm over here at a, well over 100. So this, again, is this is doing this, um, you know, parameter scan, sometimes it's called, or, or the, the, the parameter fitting. Um, doing it in a very naive way where you consider all, you know, many different settings and, you know, many different parameter combinations, that's called exhaustive search. So obviously we want to be smarter about it. Uh, that's sort of the moral of the story. There's just no way we can do it in a simple way, even with a large number of computers. So 
I mean, for example, this is, you know, 10 to the 106. So let's say, oh, I've got a million computers. Okay, well, now I'm at 10 to the 100th. Okay, I've got a billion computers. Okay, well, now I'm at 10 to the 97. I mean, obviously, I, I'm so far beyond anything that's possible that I just have to be smarter. Okay, so let's get dig into this thought a little bit more. I, again, I'm, I'm spending a bit of time on these conceptual things because the the I'll, I'll tell you in advance and a bit of a spoiler alert. You know, there, there's no fixed solution to this problem. There's no one algorithm or one approach that's going to solve it. You will have to make judgments about what you're doing, what your scope is, ranges of parameter values, those types of things. So what I'm trying to do now is give you a feeling for, you know, for a given model with the data that you have, what's going on, what's causing things to work well or work poorly in terms of looking for your parameters. So let's start out with, you know, a happy world where things work well. Okay, so he, here's our happy world. We've got a very simple model, and probably about the order of complexity of what you're looking at at the end of the last lecture, where we've got some you know, initial conditions. It creates, you know, we're generating this X over here, and then that uh, that goes on to this, this X1 over there. And so, you know, here's the, the dynamics of it. I'm, you know, creating more of uh, this um, uh, chemical species X at a rate K1, and I'm degrading it at a rate K2. That's so, so basically this system has two parameters. I'm just, I'm synthesizing and I'm degrading. So let's take a look at what goes on when we're doing a parameter fit. Let me explain this plot because it's uh, it takes a second to digest what's really going on here. So I've got two parameters, this is the K1 and K2. K1 is the x-axis, K2 is the y-axis. And along this axis, these are the different values of the parameter I might choose. These are our parameter settings. Any point in this space is a parameter setting. So you know that's that's what I'm doing. So every for every parameter setting, I will get a um, of sum of squares. In this case, I actually use the average, the square root of the average of the sum of squares, just so everything is normalized. So that's the that's the value over here. And this is a heat map where obviously I want to get to zero. And, and actually the red dot right here, this is this is how I generated the data. That's the true place I, I would like to know. So I know that the true values for K1 for the data that I'm showing here are K1 equals one and K2 equals one. So that that's where I'd like to be. As I get closer here, you can see how I go from like dark gray to light gray. That's because my, my um, uh, residuals, the so sum square of my residuals are getting smaller and smaller. So this is where I would like to be. Right. And so what's going on here? It's a little bit hard to tell. I'll show you another picture in just a second. But do you see this sort of whitish look along here, along the middle? That's where my sum of squares are, are getting smaller and smaller. Actually, if you zoom in a little bit, you can see it much better. This is on a different scale, which is why the colors are different. You see how you know I, I, I move quickly towards here. And so I can... You know, I get along this wide area, it gets wider as I get towards the middle. So that's, that is my, what's called the fitting surface. The surface here is being represented by this, um, uh, the, um, uh, the color, the heat map, you know, it'd be like a, a topo map only, you know, I'm just doing this with color. So the colors would indicate the sort of the height of the, um, uh, of the surfaces. And so the surface here is very low right there. And that's why I, I end up over there. Um, this is what's called a convex surface. Uh, if you, you know, probably dig back from your undergraduate mathematics, convex means it's sort of shaped like a bowl. And, and you can see, I mean, it sort of is bowl shape, right? I mean, going down here towards the middle, going down there towards the middle, getting that bowl shape. The, the, this is really good news if you're doing optimization, because essentially what you can do is you can just follow that contour of that bowl downward until you, you get to this point over here that the called, uh, this is called gradient descent because you're following the gradient, the shape of that bowl down. And that's a very efficient algorithm. I don't have to search the entire space. I can run it real fast. So, um, so is that end, you know, does that sort of answer all of our questions? And of course, you know, the answer is no, because with the exception of some really simple cases like this one, um, you do not have a convex space. So let's go back to that general Wolf model and see what it looks like there. 
So if we go to the general wolf model, remember this is what we look like over here. And um, uh, I'm going to look at just two of the parameters because you need a dimension space that's equal to the number of parameters. And I, I personally have trouble visualizing much more than two. Um, so let's do two. So I, I chose these two. These are two of the parameters from the general wolf model. And what I'm doing here is um, here's the true value in her model. And what I've done is just vary the value of the parameter, not in a particularly wide range either. This is, you know, the true value is about one there. And the true value here is about 0.98, something like that. So, you know, we're not varying it by a large percentage over here. And uh, these are the um, the uh, normalized um, sum of squares. So um, what you see right away, which we didn't see before, you see all these ridges. And again, this is like a, topo a topological map, uh, topographical map rather. And um, we see ridges along through here. So if you start doing gradient descent, where let's say I had the misfortune to start my search like right over here on the top of this peak over here, I probably would end up in this valley right there, quite a bit of a distance from where I should be, uh, and definitely not at the lower lower reaches of things. Or maybe over here, that might even be worse because, you know, I would still go down into a valley but not have a higher value of the the root mean squared error. And that's generally our problem: is we have these very non-convex surfaces, and we have to figure out ways to um, get to this over here, which might be over many hills and many valleys. So how do we get there? Um, so I don't want to, uh, I want to give you at least some feeling for the actual calculation, but I also want to answer this question. There are several different ways you can do this. Now, I actually don't have time to discuss the specifics of the algorithms other than gradient descent, which is very simple. Uh, I will mention differential evolution, which uses some analogies to um, um, genes uh, and, 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 and uh, reproduction in, in, um, uh, in, in biological species to sort of have this notion of, can I mix it up a bit and start in different places? Um, there's another approach you can use, which is called um, uh, multiple restarts, and that is you could do something like gradient descent, but just to pick different random places to begin. The, the problem in general is, and there's a statistical term for this, it's called the curse of dimensionality, and that is I'm in two dimensions here. You know, I actually have 16 dimensions. So my space is really big, and, and since I've got this huge space, you know, I have to pick a lot more random points to figure out where I should be. So that's the challenge. All right, so let's see where we are right now. So so here's sort of the problem and, you know, that we're facing. We've got a lot of things, you know, to find these parameter values, we've got a, a lot of effects that are sort of fighting against us. Um, we've got this complexity of the fitting surface that likely we've got something like this and not like that. Um, we've got um, the number of parameters, which makes the space bigger, and so it's harder to search. Um, there's the values of the parameters. We don't, we've got to figure out the ranges we're working this over. Bigger range means more looking, and so more, you know, more computation required. Uh, there's the starting point where I start makes a difference. Um, and then there's the nature of the observational data. Does the observational data allow me to be able to find all the parameters? All right, so um, let's see here, and I mentioned identifiability. Um, okay, let me pause for a section. I see there's one question already. Uh, the ridges uh, not containing ground truth are areas of yes, right. These are these are local extrema. That that's the uh, technical term in mathematics, right? Those are local extrema that you happen to hit because of the nature of the of of the model and the observational data. Other questions. Okay. All right. Let me switch to the um, other um, other uh, materials for this class. So the other materials I have for this class are the um, this notebook. Um, and so it has um, you you've you've already introduced Colab and they've had some experience. They've been doing the work. Okay, great. Thanks for the nod. Um, okay. So. Um, 
I'm what I'm going to do is just sort of go through the structure of this notebook and uh, give you a feeling for um, this uh, package we put together called SB uh, Stoat. Um, so a stoat is an animal that searches for things, hunts it down. And so that was the, the thought with uh, SB Stoat. Um, this sort of magic in the cell over here, I think you should have already encountered already. There's some technical details with running the Colab notebook. Um, the instructions here, you run it once, it'll fail. You run it again, it should work. So that should take care of that there. Um, and then this is the SB Stoat um, uh, package, which is how you obtain that. Um, and then there's a bunch of shared stuff that I have here. Um, and that's what's going on over here in this cell over here. This is constants and helper functions. So I'm going to skip by all that and get into running the uh, the program itself. Um, you know, it looks like actually that this is, I think, does this actually age out? I'm, it's, you know, if you wait too long in collab, it, it, sort, of, it sort of disappears. Uh, let's see here. Let's see what happens if I try and run it. Does it complain? No, it works. Great. Okay. So here's the model that we've got here. This is a relatively simple model that we're going to, we're going to do parameter estimation on this model. So this is a linear pathway. Um, I think it's what, you know, five different species, four reactions. Um, everything is mass action. It's actually all, um, it, it, technical detail here is it, it's actually a linear system because you just have, um, you don't have any um, higher order terms here for the um, for the chemical species. It's just S1 times a constant, for example. Okay, I've initially, initially in this model, all the constants are set to zero. Obviously nothing's gonna happen with that. That's just so that um, we can, um, you know, that you have to do something with defining a value to be able to, you know, see what the, the constants are. And uh, what we're going to do is the uh, this SB Stoat system is going to assign the values to K1 through K4 and iteratively try to see um, which ones are the best fit. So here is we we have to start with observational data. So here's our observational data. Um, what this is is again for you know demonstration purposes. It takes the true values. So we have some true values that we've assigned to this model here. I think the true values for K1 through K4 is it's one, two, three, four. Uh, I think that's the way it works. And then what we've done is we've added some noise. So now we have some noisy observational data. And the question is how well does the algorithm, how do well does an algorithm do with finding the true values, which are going to be one through four? Um, okay, so um, to do this analysis, to run, find the, the parameter estimates, um, we have to make a statement about what is the range over which you can you will uh, uh, have values for for k1 through k4. You remember the, the this uh, one of the the factors that affects the computational complexity of parameter fitting is the um, the number of different values you have. And so the analog here, since these are continuous, is it's the the size of the search space. So there's a, for each parameter, so there's a lower and an upper value for the uh, that parameter, and that's that constrains the algorithm. If I make this smaller, it'll work faster. But you know, what if my actual value is you know larger than the upper end? You know, what do I do then? Um, so that's why you you sort of have to pick and choose and try and figure out you know what range you're actually working in. So that's one part of what we've got over here with these parameters, uh, the this, this specification of the parameters. And what this is, if you remember that. Um, uh, pseudocode algorithm, one of the inputs was the parameters to estimate, estimate. And so this is a little, you know, these are the parameters to estimate K1 through K4 with some more details, which is this lower and upper. And then the other detail you need is where are you starting? You remember that one of our things that, you know, things could go wrong is if we start in the wrong place and we just get stuck in a ditch. Um, so um, you, this is also something you can vary with that, you know, multiple restarts kind of idea. You could start in different places and you may come up with, with different results and better values. Okay, so, so with these inputs, we've got the observational data, which I think was called up here. This is um, linear pathway, and this is a, a, a kind of Python object called a data frame. 
Um, and we're just going to call that uh, DF over here. So let's take a look at this model fitter over here. Now, um, uh, the notebook allows you, if you put a question mark in front, it'll give you details from the uh, comments about what it does. And um, it gives you what the arguments are. Um, so you've, you know, you've got arguments for the, uh, how long you run the simulation. Um, you've got the observational data about what that has to appear as and, and so on. Okay, so here's actually running the fit. Let me get rid of that for right now. Here we actually running this, this model fitter and, and uh, there are two steps to it. One of them is, um, you've probably seen this in Python, this notion of what, you know, I'm, I'm creating a new object that's gonna you know, do something for me. So that's what I'm doing over here. I'm creating a model fit, one of these fitter objects that takes in the model. In this case, it's a um, antimony model. Uh, it takes in the data, that's this data over here, and then the parameters to fit, and you saw, saw all that. And then what it's going to do is this fitter object has something called fit model, which will actually produce the, uh, the results. So let's run this. And it doesn't take too long. Okay. So that, now we've got this object that has you know, done the fit and we can do various things with it. So one thing we can do is we can get a report about how good the fit is. So let's run that report. So remember our, our, the, the true values are one, two, three, four. Well, we're not bad for that. We got, you know, we're pretty close to that. And, you know, admittedly, it's a pretty simple model. So that may be part of the reason why we're close. Um, also, obviously, if we added more noise into the, um, uh, the observational data, that will, you know, cause us to not do as well. There are a few things here that are, are useful. So this is the fitting method. I mentioned, you know, different algorithms you might use. This one is using uh, least squares or gradient descent. And the other one that I recommend is differential evolution. Uh, it takes longer, but it does a, a more it does a more comprehensive search. Uh, it's sort of a, a trade-off about how you do this. I mean, for example, you can do least squares with many additional different places where you initially start, or you could do gradient descent and then just run that for longer, and hopefully that will cover things well uh, also. This over here is interesting. This is the number of simulations I ran. So I only ran six simulations. Um, that's actually pretty fast convergence. So I, it, I, what I pretty much would suspect about this based on what we saw you know, in the earlier presentation about that idea of a convex space, I pretty much would suspect that this space is pretty close to convex because I didn't have to run it much and I used least squares and that seemed to work work pretty well. And here are some of the, the measures you might use, at least relatively for you know the quality of the fit. This is a, a chi-square statistic. I won't go into details there, but you want a lower value. Um, same thing over here with some of these, these other uh, criteria as well. And these are connections between the parameters. But the ones up here, the actual values that are estimated, uh, the algorithm, obviously, the number of evaluations, and then the um, uh, you know, chi-square or something related to that is probably what you'd like to look at. So that gives you a feeling about where you are, you know, sort of numerically in your fit. I, I don't recommend just looking at numbers like this. You actually want to see what the fit looks like because you may care a lot about the character of the fit. So um, this package allows you to plot the fits. Here's an example of such a plot where red is the uh, predicted values from the model based on the parameters that you estimated, and blue are the observational values, the observational data. And sort of, you know, a lot of times we look at a model that, you know, sort of a stock uh, measure like um, chi-square or, or r-squared or something related to that, um, it doesn't really capture what you're after. I mean, for example, over here, I mean, obviously the first species we fit very well. The second species, you know, there are these um, outliers over here. Maybe we can just sort of wave them off because those were extreme values. Over here, we almost see a trend. You know, over here, we see a little bit more they're off. And over here, we have a lot of variability, but that's sort of the nature of the data. So there's a more qualitative aspect to this that you probably want to play with as you consider your fits. Um, if you want to look at something much more detailed, 
and do what's called a residual analysis for statistics. Um, here we're looking at autocorrelations and see over time if in time on uh, the resulting uh, values that, you know, from the um, from the fits, uh, how they relate to one another. And that may be interesting in terms of knowing if there are connections between the parameters you want to capture better. Um, let me go down here a little bit more. Okay. So, um, so that's really the highlights. Um, the next level of this, and I'll just give you sort of like an outline and then a problem you can work on uh, separately to sort of, you know, hone your uh, capabilities here. As you can tell, I, I, I frame this as a kind of exploratory data analysis because you may want to try different starting values, different ranges for the parameters, um, even, you know, which data that you actually want to use. So there's a there's sort of a repetition in terms of what you're going to do like with up here where you're you know you're running you're running the fit you're looking at some of these um uh numerical values you're probably looking at the um um the output over here and you're making some judgments about you know does this look right or doesn't it and for this reason, I highly recommend, and this is something that Herbert and I do in our class, highly recommend that you sort of capture this workflow in a function, uh, in a Python function that will allow you to repeatedly um, do different analyses and then print out that information so you can make your judgments. And this is just an example of doing that so that you can get a sense about, you know, what's the quality of, of your fits as you use different combinations of of uh, techniques. Okay, so this has a little more on the optimization algorithms. Let me go down here to the exercise. So if you want to try and, um, you know, go the next step, you know, see how well uh, you sort of have just digested this, here, here's an exercise you might go through. So um, there's that general wolf model. So now we're, you know, now we're, it's not four parameters, it's more like 16 parameters. And um, you could do the same thing with generating some synthetic data. In fact, I think um, I even have synthetic data that has been generated. If we go back up here to um, this, and we look at um, the synthetic. Yeah, there is some synthetic data here. Wolf underscore DF is synthetic data for the Wolf model. So you can actually have that available to you. And try doing the parameter fits. First of all, you know, without, you know, making a, you know, a, a workflow function, just go through the same steps did with the, um, that linear pathway with the Wolf model, and then take it the next level by actually constructing that do fit kind of function and see if you can do this repeatedly. I, I think for practical um, application, you're going to be doing the fits a lot and making judgments about what works. Okay, so I'm going to stop here and see if there are questions. Or comments, appreciate that as well. I sort of made some. You know, uh, uh, I think Herbert and I've alluded to that we we teach a computational biology class, and a lot of the material we've drawn on from that class, and sort of we've we've picked you know subsets of that to present to this you know you know one day um, you know uh, training, and so um, maybe different material would be uh, would be appreciated. So comments along those lines are appreciated as well. All right. Okay. So I'm between everybody here and lunch, at least on the West Coast. But um, do we have we have a break now? Yeah. So um, we have a lunch break now. Um, okay. Yeah. Any last questions then before we break for lunch? I mean, it's a big area. I mean, parameter fitting is a huge area. And so we don't be able to touch on it. There are a lot of packages out there that you can use. Um, SP Stoad was built specifically to make it easy because a lot of them are a bit complicated to use. Um, so, I mean, there's some one area, you know, areas we haven't touched upon or touched upon is, you know, how do you measure confidence in the estimated parameters you got? you obtained, how do you do uncertainty quantification, how do you do model selection, there's a whole range of topics um, that you cover. 
but uh, hopefully that might give you a start. This gives you a start anyway. All right. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave my Zoom on, um, but I'll be back uh, 55 minutes. Okay.